Welcome back guys. We are now on 7.3, Lewis symbols and structures. So this is really going to be building upon what we talked about in 7.2. We're focusing in on covalent compounds. So we're going to use Lewis symbols for neutral atoms and ions and draw Lewis structures depend, depicting the bonding in simple molecules. The so Lewis symbols themselves are used to visualize the valence electron configurations of atoms and monatomic ions. They consist of an elemental symbol surrounded by one dot for each of its valence electrons. There's one dot per side until each of the four sides have been taken up, and then from there we start pairing the electrons off. We can also use it to show ion formation. So to start, there's some examples on the right of some Lewis symbols of simple atoms. Lithium has one valence electron, so it has that one little dot. And you can put it on any side. You can write it like that, or this, or that. It doesn't matter. Beryllium has two valence electrons, so you can write it like they show there, or you can do one, two. It really doesn't matter, again, as long as there's two dots on separate sides. Boron has three. Carbon has four, but then we get to nitrogen where we have five valence electrons. So we start by doing one dot per side, but then we have one extra valence electron. So now we have to pair it with one of these sides. And then we see oxygen has two sets of pairs and two lone electrons. Fluorine has three pairs and one electron. And neon there has that full valence shell, our nice noble gas configuration those eight valence electrons. Then below that we can see some ion formations. We start with the sodium atom with that one lone valence electron, but then it loses it to form the sodium cation. And now it doesn't have any valence electrons because it lost it from that outer shell. Calcium losing the two electrons. We can also do this of gaining electrons. So we see chlorine here, the chlorine atom gaining one electron, since it has that one space in its valence shell, to form the chlorine anion. And then sulfur is shown there gaining two electrons. And here's some Lewis symbols, um, again, for some other, um, the third period of the, of the periodic table, showing their electron configurations and then their Lewis symbols. So those are Lewis symbols. Now we're going to look at Lewis structures. And these are used to indicate the formation of covalent bonds by sharing electrons. So what generally happens with a simple Lewis structure is the unpaired or single electrons from two atoms pair up to form a single bond. And you can see that for an example here with the chlorine molecule being formed by two chlorine atoms. You have these two atoms, and one of each of them has this extra electron. And they're like, hey, look, if we share these two electrons, now each of us has eight valence electrons. So if you look at each chlorine separately, you see it has eight because of the shared pair of electrons. So this creates a single bond. So in a single bond, two electrons are being shared equally between two atoms. Well, maybe equally. In this case, equally. So these are called the single bond. These can also be called a bonding pair. The electrons on the outside that are not in the bond, they're just kind of chilling around our atoms, are called lone pairs. In a Lewis structure, there's two ways you can denote a single bond. You can do it either like shown up here with the chlorine where you have the two electrons in between being shared, but more commonly what you'll see is a single line in between the two. And that single line is denoting the two electrons. So when I was an undergrad, I would draw it kind of like the chlorine molecule here, but then I'd draw a single line between it just so I knew, hey, there's two electrons here. Another example down here is the hydrogen, H2. 
Now hydrogen is an exception. It doesn't want eight electrons. It just wants two because it just has that one S, it just has the S shell that with the one electron. So just one electron is all it needs to fill up its S shell. So two hydrogens share one elect share two electrons with each other. So you've probably noticed by now the number eight coming up a lot. And this is called the octet rule. It's the tendency of our main group atoms to form enough bonds to obtain eight valence electrons. So the number of electrons that are needed to reach an octet is generally equal to the number of bonds that the atom needs to form. For example, group 14 atoms have four valence electrons and thus need four more to make an octet, aka four covalent bonds. Group 15 atoms have five valence electrons, so that ends up being three single electrons and one lone pair. And this requires three electrons for the octet, meaning three covalent bonds. Like I said, hydrogen is an exception. It only needs one bond to fill its valence shell. So here's some examples. We have carbon tetrachloride and silane. These are examples of some group 14 elements, carbon and silicon being group, four, being group 14. They each need four electrons to fill their octet, so they form four extra bond, four bonds. You can see these nice filled octets around them. We also have some more examples here, ammonia, nitrogen being from group 15, where it needs three bonds. Water, oxygen being from group 16, so it only needs two bonds. And then fluorine being from group 17, only needs one bond to fill its octet, so it needs one electron. Double and triple bonds do exist. A double bond is, is going to form when you have to share two pairs of electrons between two atoms to give them a complete octet. Whereas a triple bond is going to form when three pairs of electrons are shared by atoms to complete their octet. Here's some example of, examples of some double bonds. Formaldehyde. There's a double bond between the carbon and oxygen. So you see these two pairs of electrons here. You can kind of play connect the dots, make the, two, the double bonds. And ethylene is another one where the carbons in this case are double bonded to each other. And when you look at, at each individual carbon, we'll look at ethylene, we have two, four, six, eight electrons. If you look back over at formaldehyde at the oxygen, two, four, six, eight, and same goes for the carbon. So each one has a nice complete octet now. So carbon monoxide and cyanide are some examples of compounds with triple bonds. You can see for carbon monoxide, they have to share three pairs of electrons. And when they do that, carbon here has a lone pair and then two, four, six, a total of eight electrons now for it. Same goes for oxygen. In the cyanide ion, same thing for nitrogen and for carbon. We have some rules for writing Lewis structures and the, using the octet rule. And we're gonna go through some examples it's a lot easier than just me giving you these rules and so if we have a simple molecule or an ion a lot of times you can make the Lewis structure just by pairing the unpaired electrons but when you have bigger molecules and molecular ions it gets a little more complicated and there is a procedure for it so the first step is to count the total number of valence electrons if you have a positive charge, so if you have a cation, you need to subtract one electron for each positive charge. When you have an anion, you're going to add an electron for each negative charge. Your next step is to draw a skeletal structure of the molecule, arranging the atoms around a one central atom. Central atom is generally the least electronegative. A lot of times there's only one of them. So you might have like CCL4, you have one carbon, so that's going to go in the center. So you put that in the center, surround it with the other atoms, 
and then connect all of them to that central atom with a single bond. So then each of those represents two electrons. From here, you're going to then distribute the remaining electrons as lone pairs on the outside atoms to complete their octets. Except hydrogen, of course, the single bond is all it needs. Then any elect leftover electrons you're going to put on your central atom. And then if you need to, you're going to rearrange your outside atom electrons to make double or triple bonds with that center atom as needed. So we're going to go through some different examples. Um, first, here's some examples of some simple structures where you don't need to do all those steps. You're able to look at their Lewis symbols and go, OK, hydrogen and bromine, boom, boom. That's where they're going to bond. Two hydrogen and sulfur. That means I have two of these extra um, hydrogen electrons, the two, these two nitrogens, you can see instant triple bond right there. So we're going to do an example, and we're going to start by looking at the structure of silicon tetrahydride, SiH4. So the first thing we want to do is add the number of valence electrons on the atom, or from each atom in our molecule. So silicon has four valence electrons. Hydrogen has one valence electron, but I have four of them, so I have to multiply that times four. So, and I have one silicon, so that's four, so this adds up to a total of eight electrons that we're going to be using. So the next step is to draw our skeletal structure with our center atom. In this case, it's going to be silicon. It's our, it's, there's only one of it. It can form multiple bonds. Hydrogen can't form more than one bond. So silicon goes in the middle, and we're gonna surround it with our other atoms of four hydrogens. And we're gonna now connect each hydrogen to the silicon with a single bond. And then you go and count how many electrons you just used. So that's two, four, six, eight. Subtract that from the amount we have here. Zero, we have now used all of our electrons, and everyone has a complete octet. The hydrogens are happy, they only want two electrons. Silicon now has eight with those uh, eight that it's sharing with all the hydrogens. So that is our structure of SiH4. The next one we're going to do is CHO2. So we have carbon which has four valence electrons. We have one of it. Hydrogen has one valence electron. We have one of it. Oxygen has six valence electrons. We have two of them, so that's 12. Sorry, there's only one valence electron from hydrogen. And then we have a negative charge. We have only one, so we need to add one electron. So this adds up to a total of 18 valence electrons. So the next step is to draw our skeletal arrangement. So in general, the least electronegative element is the central atom. And if we were to go and look at our electronegativity chart, we find that carbon is the least electronegative. So we're gonna go ahead and put that in the center. So that means that it has the hydrogen and the two oxygens surrounding it. And we can put them however we want. So I'm gonna do it like this. Our next step is to connect everything with a single bond. So now that's using up six of our electrons. So now we have 12. The next thing we're gonna do is put, distribute our um, electrons to our outside atoms. So I have 12 electrons. So if I put them on this oxygen, two, four, six, 
8, 10, 12. So now I've used up all my electrons. But we are not done. Oh, I can just, yeah, I'll add the next negative charge later. We'll come back to the overall negative. But when you see this, the oxygens have full octets, but the carbon doesn't. So now we have to do some rearranging. I don't have extra electrons to put on this carbon. So I need to form a double bond somewhere. So one of these oxygens is going to need to give up that pair of electrons to form a double bond. It doesn't matter which one you choose. So now when I do this, no matter how you want to draw those lone pairs, now I have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 electrons, as I should. Each oxygen has eight electrons. And the carbon now has eight electrons. It has two, four, six, eight from the double bond and those two single bonds. So that's our structure. And then the last thing we need to do is add brackets around it with a negative charge because the whole thing has an neg overall negative charge. So you could draw it like that, or you could also do it like this. It doesn't matter which oxygen you choose. And we'll talk about that in the next section. But first, some more examples. This next one is doing NO plus. So nitrogen has five valence electrons. One of it, oxygen has six valence electrons. And then we have a cation. which means we need to add, we have to subtract one electron. So we start off with 11 minus one, we have 10 valence electrons. Now we only have two atoms here, so there really is no central atom. We have a nitrogen and an oxygen. Start with our single bond to bond them, minus two. Now we have eight electrons. So we can go and try to fill up our electrons for everyone. We'll go ahead and go, okay, two, four, six, eight. Eh, something's not right there, is it? So oxygen has a full octet, but nitrogen doesn't. So what's gonna have to happen is this oxygen is gonna give some electrons away. And I know that the nitrogen needs a total of three bonds which could equal a triple bond. So, because if we first just do one pair of electrons, now we have N with a lone pair double bonded to oxygen with two pairs of electrons. Oxygen still has that octet, but the nitrogen doesn't. It has six electrons. So we now need to do another pair of electrons. So now this becomes a triple bond each of them with a lone pair of electrons and then an overall positive charge. One more example, OF2. So oxygen, we have six valence electrons times one, so that's six. Fluorine has seven valence electrons, and we have two of them, so that's 14. So this adds up to 20 valence electrons. Oxygen is the lower in electronegativity, so it's gonna go in the center with fluorine, do it on either side of it. And we're gonna give it our single bonds, so that's minus four electrons, and we have 16. So let's go ahead and start filling in octets. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve on our outsiders. So we have four left. So now we put that on our central oxygen and we see that's exactly what we needed. That is our final structure.
So you can see this oxygen has two lone pairs and two bonding pairs. And each of the fluorine has three sets of lone pairs and one bonding pair. Um, Father of nanotechnology, Richard Smalley, cool dude, um, did a lot of work on uh, carbon and buckyballs. So, of course, there's always exceptions in chemistry. We do have octet rule exceptions. Um, we have some central atoms that do not have eight electrons in their Lewis structures. They can be odd electron molecules, so they literally have an odd number of valence electrons, which results in, in an unpaired electron. We can have electron deficient molecules, so the central atom has fewer electrons than needed for that noble gas configuration. And we have hypervalent molecules that have a central atom that has more electrons than needed for a noble gas configuration. So let's talk about odd electron molecules. These are called free radicals. You've probably heard this term. Um, a lot of times they talk about having antioxidants as so they fight free radicals. Um, radical chemistry is actually pretty rad. Um, it's really interesting stuff the way it works. We're not going into reactions with it or anything. Um, radicals are very close to my heart in that when I was in grad school, I looked at OH radical and its effect on one compound in particular to form um, particulate matter in the atmosphere, influencing cloud formation. So that's one example. Uh, nitric oxide, this is another one that I personally did not study, but I had friends who looked at it. Um, NO, it is formed from the incomplete combustion of fuel in engines, so from your cars. And it's a very big contributor to atmospheric pollution in, in uh, city centers, so something like Los Angeles. Nitric oxide is a big contributor to particulate matter formation in the atmosphere because it reacts with other volatile organic compounds or VOCs. So to figure out the structures of these, you do the exact same steps as before. We're going to start out by figuring out our valence electrons. So from NO, nitrogen, we have those five valence electrons. Oxygen has six valence electrons. That's a total of 11. So then we have NO, connect it with our single bond. We don't have a central atom. So we're going to start by giving eight electrons to the more electronegative atom, which is going to be oxygen. So we're going to give it two, four, six. Okay, so we had minus two from the single bond, nine, now minus six from the oxygen gives us three left over. So the nitrogen, the way we do this is we give it as one pair of electrons and one single lone electron. So the next thing is to rearrange the electrons to make multiple bonds with our, to try to get octets if possible. We know we cannot have an octet for both these atoms, but we can try to get as close as possible. So let's start by taking two electrons from the oxygen to put in this double bond. And now that gives us this oxygen with the still the two lone pairs, so it still has an octet. And that gives us nitrogen now with two, four, six, seven electrons. That's as close as we're gonna get to an octet. So this is our structure of the nitric oxide radical. So now we have electron deficient molecules, and these have central atoms that do not have a filled valence shell. And these guys tend to be very reactive. I am not going to test you on drawing these because you kind of have to just know that this is how they're configured. Um, sometimes it feels like you should be able to do a double bond, but actual experimental data has shown that they have. So boron is a big example. Um, for those of you that might be chemistry majors, when you transfer over to a university and you get into advanced inorganic chemistry, super fun class. Um, in a 10 week quarter, I think we spent about two weeks just going over boron chemistry. It's really interesting stuff. 
Um, but they're very reactive. For instance, boron uh, trifluoride reacts with ammonia to form this monstrosity down here. Again, I'm not going to test you on drawing these. The last one that you guys should be able to draw are hypervalent molecules. And we're going to look at these more too in the next section. So a hypervalent molecule, these are where you have an element that are in the third and higher period. So that means they have those n is greater than or equal to three. And these guys have more than four valence orbitals and can share more than four pairs of electrons because of it. They have an empty d orbital in the same shell. So they've got that empty orbital that they can use to form more bonds. These are called hypervalent molecules. And your central atom can also have lone pairs. So here's some examples here. We have phosphorus pentachloride. So you see this phosphorus here with these five bonds. Sulfur hexafluoride with those six bonds on sulfur. And notice these are all focusing on the central atom. Okay, so it's not all the chlorines that are making multiple bonds. It's the central atoms that have more than four bonds or more than eight, eight electrons. Um, we also have this iodine pentafluoride down here. And you can see the iodine has five fluorines on it and a lone pair of electrons. Uh, this xenon tetrafluoride has four single bonds of xenon. Yes, that is a noble gas, but it can actually form uh, compounds, just not very easily. But the xenon after the four bonds also has two lone pairs of electrons on it. So these have the same rules for drawing the structures. And let's look at some examples to find the Lewis structures of ZE or XEF2 and XEF6. Let's start with XEF2. First things first, let's figure out our valence electrons. Xenon has eight valence electrons. We have one of it, so eight. Fluorine, that's seven times two, 14. So we have 22 electrons. We're gonna put xenon in the center, fluorine on either side of it. Start with our single bonds to connect them. Minus four electrons. That gives us 18. So now let's go ahead and start filling in electrons, starting with those fluorines to give them full octets. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. That leaves us with six electrons that we're going to go ahead and put around the xenon. So two, four, six. So there is, Z, is XEF2. Notice the xenon has more than eight electrons around it. Thanks to that empty valence D shell. Next, let's look at XEF6, starting with our electrons. Xenon, again, eight valence electrons. One, we have eight. Fluorine, seven valence electrons times six, 42. So we have a total of 50 valence electrons. So let's go ahead and put xenon in the center and put six fluorines around it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Connect them with single bonds. So that's 12. Now we have 38 electrons left over. So let's go ahead and fill in our fluorines. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, two, four, six, eight, 30, two, four, six. So 36 electrons, we have two left over. That means the xenon gets two of its own valence electrons. 